Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. I'm Katie Hodomacki from Midtown Reader, and we are here this evening with Margaret Rinkel, um, author of this essay collection, Late Migrations, A Natural History of Love and Loss. This book had been on my reading list since it was published by Milkweed Editions uh, last summer, and quarantine gifted me the time to read it. And I, I read most of it on my back porch, which turned out to be the perfect place to read a book like this, um, and just absolutely adored it. So I'm, I'm really grateful to Margaret for um, being willing to, to um, give us a little bit of her time and, and to talk about it. If you have a question uh, for Margaret at any time during the event, feel free to submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will take those at the end. We'll take as many as we have time for. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about Margaret and about this book. Uh, Margaret Rinkle is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, where her essays appear weekly. Her work has also appeared in Guernica, Literary Hub, Proximity, River Teeth, among others. She was the founding editor of Chapter 16, which is the daily literary publication of Humanities Tennessee and is a graduate of Auburn University and the University of South Carolina. She is joining us tonight from Nashville, where she lives. Hey, Margaret, thanks for joining Hi, us. Hi, Katie. Thank you. Uh, late Migrations is um, an unusual and captivating portrait of a family and of the cycles of joy and grief that inscribe human lives within the natural world. Its brief essays make up a memoir about family and place and love and loss and lots of other things, braided through with reflections on the nature surrounding her suburban Nashville home, which she calls backyard nature and also the nature she first fell in love with as a child growing up in Lower Alabama. Um, in the book, she writes, I am good at astonishment. And in these essays, um, she suggests that there's astonishment to be had in common things and what seems ordinary and in what we all share. Ann Patchett, another Nashville resident, calls the book beautifully written, masterfully structured, and brimming with insight into the natural world. It has the makings of an American classic. And here's what, oh, the Oprah magazine had to say. Margaret Rinkle guides us through a south lush with bluebirds, pecan orchards, and glasses of whiskey shared at dusk in this collection of prose and poetry-sized bits. As it celebrates bounty, it also mourns the profound losses we face every day. Um, so Margaret, thanks again for joining us. And I'd love to start um, by asking you to, um, well, maybe tell us a little bit about how you came to write the book. And then if you could maybe read a little bit from the book for us, uh, I'd be grateful. Sure, I, um, I didn't start writing a book. I just started writing little essays. Um, there was hardly any space between when my mother died very suddenly of uh, an an aneurysm, a hem hemorrhagic stroke, and my mother-in-law came to the very end of an 18-year struggle with Parkinson's disease, so I felt that I was really um, just immersed in loss, um, especially because my children were, my oldest son had just moved out, and my two younger sons were moving toward graduation, and I was just really feeling how temporary life was and, 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 and so sad. And I thought it might um, help to write a little bit. And I didn't, I was in the midst of just a really calamitous time with my mother-in-law's final, final months. But I just started giving myself 15 minutes a day, first thing in the morning, cup of coffee, just to write in my notebook, just um, little bitty things. Um, so that's, that's really why the book is a, a collection of really short essays is because that's the conditions under which I was first writing as, as it took me a good three years to write what ultimately became late migrations. But I, I really started it as an, as a meditation, as an act of contemplation and, and just sort of a way to wrestle a little bit with what was happening with, with in my life that was, so painful at the time. And the more I wrote about that, the more I found myself, I don't know if you've experienced that when you start delving into memories, like m memory just sort of begets memory. And I started thinking about the things in my family, in my childhood, in my family life that were not sad, that were just um, 
little, little, most of the time, just little, almost images from my childhood. And, um, and, and I realized how many of them were tied in some way to the natural world, which was kind of nice because at the same time that I was doing, writing these little family essays, I was also taking a lot of comfort from the natural world. I mean, one of the things when you have young children is that you're sort of always focused down like this. You're not focused out. And as they were growing up, I was spending more time focusing outward. And that was in a way returning me to myself. It was giving me back the self I had been before I was their mother. So anyway, I thought um, after you asked me if I would read a little bit, I thought I might read an essay from from uh, the childhood section, just because it, it sort of captures, I think, both the um, the nature of my relationship with my brother, who who I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this later, who did all the artwork in the book, um, but also um, it gives you a sense of how permeated um, my ch the my childhood, the childhood of any child of my generation, was with the natural world. I mean, if you grow up in the, in the rural South, or, or even in, by the time this essay comes along, you're, we were living in a, in Birmingham, which is not rural. Um, but you know, in that day and age, you, it wasn't a given that homes were air conditioned. So all the windows were open, screen doors were, uh, the, you know, it, you, you felt the breeze, even if you were in the house, you smelled the rain coming. So it was a, a a real immersion into the natural world, even even indoors in a way. This one's called Creek Walk, Birmingham, 1969. The rocks are gray slate, massive slabs cantilevered over the water as though the outstretched feathers of a great prehistoric bird had been caught in stone. My brother and I are barefoot picking our way across the rock. We are always barefoot. The pads of our feet are thick, toughened by concrete and asphalt and gravel roads. And anyway, shoes would be useless on this slick rock, worse than useless. We have not discussed a plan and so we are making our way to the creek bed with no real intention. We have nowhere to be and nothing to do for hours on end for days and days on end. It is summer and autumn is inconceivable to us. School will be reinvented every year, an astonishment every year. Where were the nuns all hiding while we were walking barefoot on the hot concrete? We are not thinking of school or of the nuns. We are thinking of nothing. Or perhaps we are wondering if we will see another rattlesnake. Seeing any snake would be a cause for remark, but we have only once seen a rattlesnake. Mainly, we will turn over rocks on the bank of the creek looking for worms and roly-polies. We aren't fishing. No one has ever taken us fishing. We're not the kind of children who would enjoy fishing. But we know we can summon fish by tossing worms into the water, and we like to feel the fish mouthing the freckles on our legs. Sometimes there are salamanders on the bank. Sometimes there are tadpoles in the foamy water at the edges of the backwash. Sometimes there are crawdads under the rocks that jut into the water. Always there are dragonflies, blue and bottle green and scarlet red, hovering over the flashing water. Always there are jays scolding from the dark pines. We see them and we don't see them. We hear them and we never register their sound. The mud and the moving water smell vaguely of decay, but the smell does not disturb us or inspire the first curiosity. We've never even noted it. These are our sights and our sounds and our smells as casual to us as the smell of our own breath in our cupped hands, as the sound of our own blood in our ears when we lie down on the biggest rock and hang our heads over the edge to dangle tickle tails in the water, tricking the fish into rising. 
Farther down, closer to the highway, there are words scratched into the slate on the other bank. The letters are large and ghostly white. F U C K. My brother sounds it out, a perfect practice word for someone still learning phonics from the adventures of David and Anne, the Catholic school equivalent of Dick and Jane. He pronounces it correctly, then what does it mean? It's a word people say when they're mad, I tell him. I don't know what it means. We pick our way back toward the bank we will climb to start heading home. Clouds of minnows race from our feet. Clouds of grasshoppers rise from the timothy grass above the rocks. Clouds of gnats hover above the water, part for our small bodies and coalesce again behind us. We climb out and sit together on the slanted rock to wait for our feet to dry in the hot sun. At home, it is almost time for supper, but we can't tell time. Thank you for reading that. I love that. <laughs> Perfect practice word for someone still learning. <laughs> I love that line. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the structure of the book and how you decided it, how do you decided to structure it that way? It's, um, like I said, it's, it's many essays about many different things. It's a collection of snapshots or vignettes, and in some ways it feels eclectic or sort of scrapbook-like, but it does, it does have an intentional structure to it. It seems carefully ordered as it begins with your mother's birth and ends um, with her death and, and your processing her death. Um, so how, how did you decide to structure it the way that you did? Well, I wasn't, at first, I, as I said, I wasn't thinking about writing a book at all. And then I, I thought I was writing a little pile of family essays just for my own sake. Um, and then another little pile of nature essays because, uh, you know, basically all hell was breaking loose and I, it made me feel it, I took comfort from the rhythms of the natural world that were in some ways very predictable. Um, it was a lot of, I mean, no matter how, it's like there's a line in Shelley, um, oh wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind. And I think there's a sense that the, the predictability of the seasons, that spring always follows winter, um, helps you through the winters. And so I was, I was writing those things too, just again, just for my own sake. And then I, I was in, a, I'm in a writer's group. I'm actually in two writer's groups. Um, and one is just a general group and one is specifically for, um, creative nonfiction, which was a new form for me when I first started writing these essays. I had been a poet and I had been a journalist, but I had never tried writing uh, personal essays or memoirs before much. And so um, it was It was really that they were the ones who said, you know, you're writing a book. And I'm thinking, well, no. And my first thought was, no, I'm not writing a book. And then I thought, well, I don't know, maybe it could be two books, but how could it ever just be one book? But, but the more I thought about it and the more they um, encouraged me, I, I could see that so much and when you're paying it really close attention to the natural world a lot of what you're going to see involves birth and death and a lot of what i was writing about involved birth and death partly that was because my grandmother um, made an early appearance in the book and then decided to stay my brother had my brother had, uh, years or years and years earlier had interviewed her about the story of her life and by then uh, just on an audio tape and by then she um she really defined her life by births and deaths and 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 surgeries <laughs> and so the her whole you know the, all, all those interviews were about when somebody was in the hospital when somebody somebody's funeral who came to that funeral and I started seeing the parallels there um, that the life my grandmother was remembering the life I was seeing in my the life and death cycles in my backyard my grief over my mother my grief over my mother-in-law it all sort of uh, came, I realized that they did belong together, but I could not figure out what the structure would be. And I tried a couple of different things. I, I would spread everything out on the floor, print it out, and then try to see if I could see how they might work. And, and one structure I had in mind was that there would be 
one nature essay and one family essay that sort of echoed each other, and that would be a pair. And then I would create another pair, and they, it was just, I could see how those pairs went together, but I couldn't see anything else. And then I tried, okay, well, what if we set it up as a the cycle of the seasons? What if it went uh, late winter with a death and kind of ended back with rebirth in the springtime? But but the family essays didn't fit easily into that structure. So it was really my editor's idea at Milkweed. I have a, a, a brilliant editor named Joey McGarvey, and she she said, what if you put the family essays in chronological order and then intersperse the nature essays as they pick up a theme or as they um, echo uh, an image or the language of one of, uh, in one of the family essays. And that ended up opening the whole thing to me because once I put the family essays in um, chronological order, I could see where the gaps were in, in telling that story. And I could write essays that specifically filled those gaps. And because I was now thinking of it as a, as a collection, I could write those essays in a way that allowed me to pull back in the nature essays more overtly. So it's really a memoir in essays with some digressions. Um, and the memoir is, you know, I mean, actually, Joey is the one who wrote the, the subtitle too, A Natural History of Love and Loss. And that's what it is. It's, um, it's, my nat it's my history and it's also the history of my experience with the natural world. So I'm not a scientist. I'm just a I'm just somebody who loves bugs and birds and, you know, yeah. snakes, yeah. snakes and squirrels, everything, really. Yeah. Yeah, you talk in one of your essays about meeting another writer who says, so are you a trained naturalist? And you have to, <laughs> no, I'm not. But I think what, you are a trained, you are a trained poet. And, and that's, that's what I get from, from these essays. It's somebody who's astonished, like you said, or fascinated with nature and then is able to express that um, in this very poetic way. So, um, could you tell- Well, I have a feeling though, the real ornithologists and the real entomologists, they might go, ah, you know, because it is, it is really just a generalist approach to the natural world. It isn't a scientific, it, there's, there's, the information that's in the book is accurate because I, I'm, I'm, you know, I spent a lot of my professional life doing research, so it's, it's not, not true. It's just not based in a textbook kind of understanding of science. Sure, sure. Um, so you mentioned your brother Billy's artwork, um, which is, he's, these illustrations throughout the book, which are just really beautiful and unique, um, so everybody another one looks like a bluebird which i love um i would love for you to talk a little bit about that was that your plan from the beginning to to include his artwork it was my plan to include his artwork but not these artworks my original plan when i was doing those pairings my original plan was uh almost like a coffee table book that there would be um an essay about the natural world and a, and a piece of Billy's artwork. And then you turn the page, an essay about the family and a piece of Billy's artwork. So I was imagining a true dialogue, um, an equal billing for him. And in part that was because he's only a year younger than I am. And so we were uh, treated like a single entity by our parents. We have a younger sister. So there, were, there was the big kid, which was collectively Margaret and Billy. And there was the little kid who was Lori. But, um, you know, uh, because we were together, we were allowed to just, we had a lot of freedom. We were allowed to just stay together, you know, kind of the buddy system. You could basically go anywhere your feet could carry you back in those days. Nobody thought about uh, dangers. It, you know, there were, of course, rattlesnakes, but, you know, I guess, I don't know what my parents were thinking. They just didn't think about it. So, um, so I really, uh, and Billy's always been an artist, always, always. I think sometimes I became a writer because I couldn't be an artist because I could see what he could do from the earliest, earliest age. And, and, and I recognized that it was uh, beyond my capacity to do that, but also that there was so much pleasure in it for him that if I could find something like that, it would give me pleasure too. And so we often did all through our um, childhood, little, little 
presence for our parents or our grandparents or our friends when we got into high school and college. But we always worked together. In high school, I was the editor of the school paper. He was the art director. In college, I was the editor of the school magazine. He was the art director. I mean, it kind of went through graduate school even, but we hadn't done a project together in decades. And I thought, well, of course, if I'm going to write about my grief, it would, of course, it would involve Billy because he was grieving the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, once it became clear to me, because I was a neophyte at this whole thing, that I didn't, that I, original conception I had for the artwork was, uh, was unrealistic from a publishing standpoint, because it was too exp it was going to be too expensive to do a coffee table book on slick paper with, um, but as the project evolved, um, the folks at Milkweed wondered if Billy might be willing to do some artwork specifically for this book. Whereas I was just thinking his artwork was so similar to my own aesthetic. He didn't need to do any original work. I would just pair existing artwork. But of course that artwork was sometimes horizontal, sometimes vertical, sometimes big, sometimes small. So he did, he, in one, in one summer, he did the cover illustration and all 19 internal illustrations um, specifically in response to the essays in the book okay oh, but the thing cool. I really love let me just like just plug my brother's brilliance for a minute yeah go ahead he was he was trying to figure out that one's not as clear he was trying to figure out how he could visually help to draw the nature essays and the family essays together Mm -hmm. So he came up with this idea, if you look at it, each one of the pieces of artwork is framed by an antique picture frame that came from an old family album that mm -hmm. he bought a, a ton of these little antique photo frames. And his idea was to you to, to not to do any illustrations of the family essays, to let people imagine their own families in those in their minds when they're but for the nature essays to in close those yes to enclose those in a picture frame that looked like it came from a family album so that the bluebird or the marigold or the um the rabbit seems like a member of the family because that's really how they come across you know they come across as a kind of part of the extended family yeah yeah oh, that is brilliant that is brilliant and i love this i love the cover too so is this a profile is this a picture of you as a little girl? Is that what this is? It is. It's based on a, um, it's based on a, a little, one of those little paper silhouettes that I don't know if they still do it, that um, you could get at a, at an art, like a street art fair, a sidewalk art fair. And I remember sitting for it. It's only about that big in, in real life, but he blew it up and traced around it and then filled it in with these images. Oh, that's beautiful. How cool. The other interesting thing, another interesting choice that you make in the book is to use your grandmother's words. So, so several of the essays are told in her words, um, and those came from transcripts, I guess, of, of your brother's interviews with her, right? Yes. Um, I didn't yeah. initially think I was going to include her actual voice, but, um, you know, after, shortly after mom died, we were going through, you know, all the things that you go through when you're cleaning out a house. And we found these, I don't know if, I don't know if she had them and we found them or if Billy found them again when he was putting away some of the things he had kept from mom's house. I can't remember how those tapes came to light after, oh, I don't know, probably 20 years um, of just, but he, um, he hired someone to transcribe them. And so I had the transcription um, and I was using it just to fact check my own memories because so I wanted to include the story of mom's birth because it was such a, a family story that was told so many times. My grandmother lived until I was, I can't remember, 45 or 47, wow. I mean, pretty far up there. And I heard the same stories over and over again. And so I, I wanted to include that story because I loved that story so much. Um, and uh, and then I went and then I was going, well, I'm going to check on this and I'm going to check this. And I'm going to check this. And finally it hit me. Why don't I just let her tell those stories? Because she had such a, a unique voice. And I thought, um, you, you know, there's always a little bit of um, 
skepticism that greets childhood memoirs because you as a reader at least for me I'm going well I mean how does she really remember that mm -hmm. um, she was only four she was only seven she was so I, I thought it would give some gravity and to and some seriousness to the um, the, the seriousness with I took with which I took the responsibility to tell the truth insofar it was possible for me to verify everything I possibly could um, and also I just love having her voice in there yeah yeah I, I liked that too I liked having a, a voice from another generation uh, kind of given given a chance to speak in there and it made it feel even more like a family project like a collaboration it's interesting what you say about um, childhood memories you have you have an essay in here I think it's called tell me a story of deep delight and it's really interesting because it's, it's about a childhood it's about a story that your mother told about you and your sister but it's all and so you tell that story but then you kind of poke at the memory a little bit it's a little bit like well this is sort of what I remember but is it really and is 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 what my mother remembers really accurate and where's the value sort of where's the value in in all this which is really interesting to me I'm really glad you noticed that because that's one of the strategies I used throughout I mean I haven't taught um, writing in a long long time but I think that you know one of the one of the ways it seemed to me that you acquire some authority as a writer of memoir is to admit the places where you don't have a clear memory. I mean, I had, I was fortunate because I have a brother who's only a year younger than I am and who was in every part of my childhood. We also have a first cousin who's the same age as my brother. So the two of us are 18 months apart <laughs> in age, the three of us, I mean, we're all in the same, uh, born all in the same time. And so, you know, if I had any questions at all, I would check with Billy or I would check with um, Shannon. Sometimes I check, I checked with my sister, Lori, and she would, it, but she was only like two in that, in in that memory so her memory she has no memory of being two years old um, but we all we both remember my mother our mother telling that story over and over again but it was a good opportunity for me to and I do that throughout like there's a there's an essay where um you know somebody pulls a gun on the three of us me and Billy and Shannon and um and uh, and I try to say several points of that essay, did we do this? And I phrase it more as a question than as a statement because there are parts about that encounter that I remember very, very well. It tends to focus the mind when someone is pointing a shotgun at your head. But it, 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 there were other things I don't recall, but, but I pulled in Billy's memory and Shannon's memory to fill in. And, and so I, th I think that's one responsibility we have as writers to our readers is like, for me, uh, uh, as a reader of memoir, I want to know what's true. Mm -hmm. And I want to know when you are filling in the gaps through your own reason or logic or what makes sense in the context. I don't want to get to the end of a memoir and read that three characters have been combined into one for the purpose of storytelling. I see the argument for doing that, but that's not the kind of memoir I wanted to write. Sure, sure. Um, uh, in the book, you talk about your Catholic upbringing, um, and anyone who reads it will notice plenty of biblical references and themes. Uh, and so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what your, um, the influence that your faith has had on you as a writer. I, you know, I think that um, I was, I meant to look this up, shoot, and I forgot to. I meant to look up who said this, that the South is a God-haunted region. I think that, um, it's really almost impossible to, to untangle family and community from faith, um, especially in the rural South, because the church was the center of the community. It was, I mean, people got up and they worked from right before sunup until after sundown because that's how they were gonna survive during the Great Depression. There wasn't, you know, there, there were there weren't opportunities to um, to just you know go and meet for a cup of coffee at Starbucks. There was nothing like that in that world. Um, so church was the center of the community, and and also um, the the taking very seriously the prohibition, the the um, not the prohibition, but 
I, I say prohibition against working, but really the, the requirement to honor the Sabbath, to take Sunday as a time of rest and reflection. And I think that that world is, was so ingrained in me. Um, and also just the, the comfort. I mean, when you are, when you are grieving a lost one, a lost loved one, it is very comforting to you to feel that, not that everything happens for a reason, because I don't believe that, but that, that, that out of suffering can come uh, comfort and even joy in time um, with, uh, with spiritual reflection, reflection and prayer. And, um, and that was a great comfort to me. Mm. Most of the religious, rel I, I want to make it clear that this book reads very much like a pagan testimonial and not like a Christian one. Most people reading it don't, for example, know, I mean, I've, I'm, I'm basing this on the, on the reviews I've read that, that what the Beatitudes are, for example, or somebody asked me in an interview a couple weeks ago, um, what the title He Is Not Here refers to about the essay of finding the empty bunny nest on Easter Sunday. So I think those references are really more, um, for me, writing, it was, they were really more private touchstones than they were, there's nothing in this book that's overtly about religious faith, I don't think. Right, sure, sure. Um, what other what other writers have influenced your work? Whose writing do you most admire or enjoy? I I um, am a, a a fairly ecumenical reader. I don't read um, a lot of suspense or thrillers or or those novels that are really designed to be page turners. But I love poetry and I love creative nonfiction and I love literary fiction and I. I love children's books. I would say that E.B. White's Charlotte's Web is as much an influence on this book as anything I read as an adult, because I read that book so many times as a child. Um, in college, I fell in love with um, Walden by Henry David Thoreau. That worldview is very evident, I think, in this book. Of course, Annie Dillard and, um, and uh, mm, let me think, maybe, I mean, people have compared uh, the writing to, um, I'm trying to think, um, the poet um, who just died, um, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, it'll come to me in a second. Um, the famous poet who just died. But, uh, you know, I, those are all, I think, writers that I was, whose style influenced me. But when I'm just reading, I, there's kind of almost nothing I don't like to read. Um, in those categories. Um, I'm reading a lot right now. I'm writing a lot of blurbs during this season. Um, and I'm reading a lot of books that are coming out in the late summer and early fall. And that's really fun to get a sneak preview, but it kind of um, brings to a halt any dinner party or Zoom dinner party conversations about what are you reading? Because, yeah, they aren't out yet. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah, you're not referring to Mary Oliver, are you? Just yeah, Mary Oliver, there you go, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, that was a dumb thing to forget, yeah. Oh, no, your work reminds me of, of, of her, so that makes, that makes sense. I, I like her, I love her work, I, 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 um, but, you know, I read it obsessively in college, and I really haven't read it since then, mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm naming off some influences of books I read decades ago, that that I think have just really stuck with me. Um, as far as like books, I would recommend um, if people have already if people have read Late Migrations and they want to. Um, my friend Mary Laura Philpot has written this really brilliant memoir and essays. We we sort of wrote them at each other's kitchen tables as part of our writers group. Her book is called I Miss You When I Blink, and it does a lot of the same things that Late Migrations does. She's younger than I am. Hers is, uh, and she's also way funnier than I am. So her book is really, really funny, but it's about wrestling, trying to find meaning from an ordinary life, not, not a novel, not a memoir about surviving some kind of terrible thing, but um, uh, a memoir about wrestling with the things that ordinary people wrestle, wrestle with and trying to create a meaningful life. Sure, sure. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for those recommendations. We have a couple um, 
questions from viewers. Um, Keegan would like to know, what do you think it accomplishes to tell personal stories woven with natural history ones? And do you have advice for writers on doing this work and putting it out into the world? Um, I guess my first advice would be to uncouple those two things. So the creating of the writing should be a completely different thing from the question of how to get it out into the world. Um, maybe this is just because it's the way I did it, but I think when you're writing with an eye toward an audience, you write differently. And I say that as, the, as a writer with a weekly deadline for a newspaper. Um, it's so much more freeing to just keep that question of who's going to read it, why are they going to read it, off the table until you have a pretty big stack of pages. So that would be the first thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is um, a lot of people who haven't, you know, survived something horrific or, or done something extraordinary will ask themselves, why should I write this? Who could possibly care about this? And my answer to that is you aren't, it's not an act of ego to do this kind of writing. It's an act of generosity because what you're saying to your reader is we are in this together. I trust you to understand what I'm saying. And, um, and so if you look at it that way, sort of a, the way a child would look at a, a, a picture that she's drawn or a poem that she's written or a song that she's learned all the words to, it's, it's with a sense of, look, ma, you know, look, ma, no hands, you know, look what I can do. It's a exuberance. It's happiness. It's sharing. If you can try to find a way to think of your writing in those terms, less, oh, this is all about me and nobody cares about me, but more, we, are, I mean, we are a part of a, we, human beings are community creatures. We live, we sleep snuggled up together. We carry our young in our arms for years. We are meant to be together. And not everybody is a writer. It's a gift to be able to articulate that experience. It's a gift to be able to say, this is what it feels like to lose your mother. Um, this is what it feels like to lose a beloved childhood dog. This is what it feels like when a fish nipples on the freckles on your legs. I mean finding words for that experience, for some people, they will never find those words and reading your words helps them find the language for what they're experiencing. So that's my second piece of advice is like somehow figure out how to take that question off the table too. Does anybody really want to read this? And then the last little piece of advice I always give is when people ask me this question is, how do you do it? How do you fit it into your life? you don't give yourself too big of a task. Like for me, it was 15 minutes a day. I mean, I know people who say 10 minutes a day. Um, the, the advantage of little bitty, little bitty times, like saying, I'm gonna, this is a gift I'm gonna give myself. I am delivering every minute of my day up to someone else's needs, but I am gonna give myself these 15 minutes, first thing in the morning, last thing before bed, whatever during lunchtime, whatever it is, this is just going to be for me. Um, and not, don't worry about, okay, well, not much comes out of 15 minutes. You get a sentence sometimes. You get two or three or four sentences. You don't generally get a book. But if you keep at it, you can get a book. You know, I mean, it doesn't take, you don't have to, I think most writers, when they're trying to carve out time, they say, oh, I'm going to write a thousand words a day. Or, oh, I'm good, which is what they do during NaNoWriMo in November. Or, oh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to sit here for an hour. Oh, I have an hourglass. I'm going to turn it upside down. That's too much. That's too, that's too intimidating. Find the thing that isn't intimidating. Because the practice, the daily practice of it, it has this self-reinforcing um, power after a little while. After you've done it a few days, you think, oh, this makes me happier. This makes me feel more settled, more calm. And then that makes you want to do it the next day. But the other great thing about a daily practice, even if it's a very brief one, is that it's always in the forefront of your mind. So you're not waiting, to, like if you're going to say, you're not waiting, for, like I used to say for years, I said, I'm going to wait until things settle down around here. 
my children all laugh at me like, mom, things are never going to sell. They never have. Why do you keep thinking they ever going to? And it's true. If you keep waiting for the big chunk, maybe you get one chunk and you think, okay, I'm going to get another one next Saturday afternoon or next Sunday morning or whatever. And and then it doesn't reappear for six more months. Then you spend your whole time trying to recreate that mental state that you were in. Whereas if you're just doing a little bit every day, it's always just kind of turning a little bit, turning and turning and solving problems for you when you don't like, what was that word I was looking for? Oh, it'll pop up at two in the morning. And, um, and I think that's encouraging. A little yeah. bit of encouragement goes a long way. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's great. Um, follow-up question, uh, Liz would like to know, do you have a new project underway and are you still writing just 15 minutes in the morning? If you're writing more, what schedule have you established? Uh, there are no schedules anymore. We are in a pandemic and my empty nest has filled back up and I, um, no, there is no 15 minutes a day anymore, but that's, um, primarily because, um, I now have this weekly, when I, when I started Late Migrations, the very first essay that I wrote that ended up being in the book, it's not the first essay in the book, but the very first one, um, I sold to the New York Times. And, but it was uh, two years in before I became a weekly writer for the Times. But a weekly deadline is it can be brutal. It's, you know, by the time you've done the writing and the revision and you've gone through the editorial process and you've communicated with the photo editor about how, where the photographer needs to go. And then you've gone through copy editing and you've answered those questions. And then it's time to start that process all over again. So I have started um, a new book. I, I hope I'll have some news on that front in uh, not too long, but I can't talk about it right now. Um, but I haven't yet um, gotten to the point where I'm really immersed in it because I sort of feel like um, I'm keeping that muscle really uh, warm in, in this newspaper writing I'm doing. And then I'll be able to turn in earnest to the book once I have some, once the book is, it's um, found a home and it's, and I have an editor who's helping me sort of shape it a little bit. Okay, that's exciting. Well, maybe by the time it comes out, we'll be through this and you can come to Tallahassee and, and present it at Midtown Reader. That would be great. I would love about. to do that. I, lo I would love to do that. I, I, I've i loved these Zoom um, and, and Facebook and Google Hangout uh, meetings because it's such a, uh, you know, it's just, it's really nice to have some way to communicate with the outside world, but it's not a substitute for meeting real people and signing their books and holding their hands and yeah 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 absolutely well we'll get we'll get back to that at some point hopefully so well thank you so much we are out of time um but i really really appreciate your time and and your thoughtfulness and and this conversation so thank you so much for doing this with us margaret thank you so much and thank you for your careful careful reading of late migrations uh, you, great great, great questions thank you <laughs> Yeah. All right. Good night, everybody. Have a great evening. Good night.